coming together. Now, what if Martin Luther, what if Martin Luther would not have been focused on the work that God had called him to do and started chasing the church too? The building wouldn't have been built. This is why, brothers and sisters, we have to be careful not to be chasing Nancy Pelosi all over the place. We have to be careful not to be chasing Biden all over the place. We have to be careful not to be chasing so many things rather than doing what God has called us to do because God was about to release the winds. And if things were not in place, guess what? It would be much harder to do it. So while people are fighting, you know what I learned from kids? And that's this. You notice every time you get on the phone, what do your kids do? Do they sit there and bother you? No, your kids get out and they start making a heyday. They say, mommy's daddy's on the phone. They, they're, bothered. They're, they're occupied. Next thing you know, you're sitting there talking to you like, Wait, where's everybody? <laughs> they left. And I've noticed that every time somebody come, I'm on the phone, the kids like just, and before you know it, I'm like, I get off the phone, I say, where the kids at? They like, oh, they're in the shop somewhere. They done took all the computers out of the house, and they done went to the shop so they don't have to be bothered by me. Because they know I'm going to tell them to get off of it. Now, I use that to say this. When we see the world occupied with itself, we need to be about our father's business. Amen. We need to make sure that we're putting things in place because guess what? We know the winds are going to be released. Right now, brothers and sisters, the church is being tormented. Pretty soon, God will allow the winds to slay. And if we are not in position when that time comes, oh, it's going to be severe. Do we got it? So God says, I'm, hold, I'm holding it. Yes, they're going to torment, but guess what? They're not going to come near any that have the seal of God. So in the meantime, what was Martin Luther doing during, during the Protestant Reformation? Give me some of the things. What were some of the things Martin Luther was doing? We know about the 95 Thesis. Okay, he was, he was writing the Bible. All right, so he was doing a printing work. What else was he doing? Martin Luther and Melanchthon were starting schools. So Martin Luther was writing the Bible. In other words, he was printing tracts, trying to get the Bible in everybody's hand. Why uh, 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 William Tyndale? Bible in everybody's hand. Martin Luther and Melanchthon were starting schools. For what? To make people Protestants. He was making them Protestants as they were leaving the popular schools and they were coming to his schools of the prophets and learning how to be Protestants. Are we together? So while God was holding the winds, Martin Luther was putting, a, he was building upon the framework that Wycliffe had put in place as he sent out his lollards all throughout the lands, car portering and taking books everywhere. They were working while these things were going on. Do you got it? So, this is history for us to learn. This was localized. In other words, it was localized around the Eastern Empire. But in Revelation 7, when God releases the four winds, it's not just going to be in the East, it's going to be around the world. So, while torment is taking place among the church, Pretty soon, the winds will be let loose to slay. So while there's torment, and God is telling you that he will hold them so you can work, then guess what you should be doing? You should be working, searching and asking God, where's your talent? What can I be doing for God? What can I be engaged in at this time to put up the work? Because when you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah came, and Nehemiah put every family on a part of the wall. He didn't do all the work himself. He put everybody on the wall. And everybody that shouldn't have been in there, Nehemiah got rid of them. And he put the families on the wall. And he said, listen, you need to have one uh, to work with, and you need to have your other hand on the sword. You have to deal with the enemies. And he said, you know what? It is getting so bad. Guess what? You can't even leave the building. You can't even go home. They said the men didn't even put off their clothes to sleep. 
they had to work throughout the night. Why? Because there were so in, many enemies there. And God says in the book of Daniel, the wall will be built again in what type of times? Not easy times, troublous times. From without and from within. From the false Samaritans in, in, in the Persian Empire time and from Sam Ballot, Gershom, and Tobiah on the inside. But in spite of it all, guess what we got to do? We got to finish that wall. Yes, there's Sam Ballas and Tobiah and Gershom that should not be there. But guess what? Keep working as you deal with them. Keep working. Keep working. And we need to find out what that, and we need to keep understanding what that work is. Amen? Notice. It says, but in 1449, the termination of 150 years, uh, the 150 years, a change came. When the sixth angel sounded, it was commanded to do what? Take off. Take off the restraints which had been imposed on the nation, by which they were restricted to the work of tormenting men, and their commission was enlarged so as to do what? Permit them to slay, Permit them to slay the third part of men. This command came from the four horns of the golden altar. The four angels. These were the four principal sultans which the M Ottoman Empire was composed. Located in the country watered by the great river Euphrates, these sultans were situated in Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad. Previously, they had been restrained, but God commanded, and they were what? And they were loosed. The four angels were loosed. How long? For an hour, a day, a month, and a year. As to slay the third part of men. This period, during which Ottoman supremacy was to exist, amounts to 391 years and fifth days. So in other words, from the start, from July 27, 1449, when? July 27, 1449 is when the sixth angel began to sound. And he would sound for how long? 300 91 years and how many days? 15 days. Brothers and sisters, write it down. Notice, thus, a prophetic period in 360 days or 360 literal years. A prophetic month is 30 prophetic days, a literal 30 years. And here we have a diagram. The fifth angel, the rise of Islam. You notice I didn't put the date there. The sixth trumpet is called the what? Second, Second woe. July 27, 1449, the restraint is moved. For how long? For 391 days and years. Fifteen days. The three woes. All right? And I'm going to have to go back to get to my chart. It says, one prophetic day is one literal year, and an hour or a 24th part of a prophetic day would be fit, would be 24, would be a 24th part of a literal year, or 15 days. The whole amounting to 391 years and 15 days. All right? <clears throat> it says, let this historical fact be carefully examined in connection with the prediction given above. This was not a violent assault made on the Greeks by which their empire was overthrown and their independence taken away, but simply a voluntary, this is speaking of the Mohammedan empire, a voluntary surrender of that independence into the hand of the Turks. I'm sorry, this is speaking of the, the Greeks and the Turks. It says the authority and supremacy of the Turkish power was acknowledged when Constantine virtually said, I cannot reign unless what? Unless you permit. So this is when the Greeks or the Eastern Empire gave their power over to the Turks 
and they were finally able to conquer Constantinople, which today is called Turkey. I want to go back before I get to there because there was something I, okay, this is what I want to show you. This sixth trumpet of the prophetic time, the trumpet would only sound for a duration of time. And when you look at the duration of time, the 391, 391 years and 15 days, it would bring us to what time? August 11th, 1840. Are, are, are we there? That's where the 391 years and 15 days, it would bring you to this time. Because the Bible tells us that the sixth angel was to sound for this allotted time. Are you with me? This was the allotted time, so when this time was over, that would be the end of the blowing of the sixth trumpet, which would make room now, or which would leave us one trumpet left, the seventh trumpet. We're not going to study that today. I didn't pass all this. All right. Passing this. All right. We looked at this. All right. The restraint was moved. This is the woes. All right. Let's see. Here we go. In the year 18, in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy exists, um, excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Lynch, one of the leading ministers, pre preaching the second advent, published an exposition on what chapter? Revelation 9. Revelation 9. Predicting the fall of Ottoman Empire. So two years before the Ottoman Empire would relinquish their power, someone began to study it and began to say the Ottoman Empire is going to fall based upon world events and based upon what the Word of God says. Now, when you look in history, it will show you that the Ottoman Empire came, his last sultan walked out in 1922. They all, it was, a, it was a big festivity. The last sultan walks out, and that was the end of the Ottoman Empire. But prior to that, they had already given up power, and they were only now a shadow. They were a puppet government. Notice, it says, two years before, did an exposition on Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in A.D. when? 1840. 1840. Sometime in the month of August, and only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote this. Allowing the first period of 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before uh, Diokazes ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years and 15 days commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on when? August 11th, 1840. When the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople made by may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, and found to be the case, Josiah Lynch writes in the Signs of the Times. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of what? The Allied powers of Europe. And thus placed herself under the control of what? Christian nations. At this particular time, the Ottoman Empire was at war with Egypt. And... Uh, um, the, 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 the Pasha of, of, of Egypt was Muhammad Ali, not the boxer. Um, and what happened was they were trying to form an alliance with Egypt, but Egypt refused them. And then they went to the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire accepted their protection because they knew that they would be overthrown by the powers in Egypt. And they accepted their protection and their power. And the Egyptian ruler had to back off and leave them alone. 
This happened to the ambassadors on August 11th, 1840. When it happened, it says, the, exact, the, the event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful what? Impetus, power, was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and in publishing his views, and from 1840 to 1844, the work did what? It rapidly extended. Are we together? Brothers and sisters, it was at this time in 1840 is when Revelation 10 comes into being. We'll talk about that when we get, as we lead into the seventh trumpet. So after this prediction takes place, after these angels are loosed to go into the, uh, loosed and to begin now to torment, not just to torment, but to kill and to slay men, a third part of men, we realize that the third part was dealing with Rome. How it was broken up into three. One third is one third of a whole. And so it was dealing with the whole of Rome. And so when it's talking about this third, it was specifically pointing to the Eastern Empire. Are we together, brothers and sisters? You with me? So now what happens, when the date was given, that meant that that restriction, that, that unleashing of the Ottoman Empire as they spread with their, again, still obscuring the sun because their doctrines are still going with them. Enemies of truth, they're still spreading, but now they're adding to their doctrines, and that is this, not just tormenting, but killing, slaying. And now... A check, August 11th, 1840, is put on Islam, is put on their power. Their government is brought to check. When we look at Islam today, is it still spreading? Yes, I answered that for you. It's not a trick question. It's still spreading. But guess what? Are they united? No. There is no unity among them anymore. They have broken back up, as it were, to what locusts do. They have no king over them. But their doctrines are still spreading. They're still going forth throughout the earth. They're still tormenting. They're still there. They're still, they, but they have no king over them. Guess what? Satan is going to bring them all back together again. Satan is going to bring them, not just them, because the Bible says in Revelation 13 that, that, that the beast is going to lead the world to worship the dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. The Bible says in Revelation 17 that the kings of the earth will rule with her for one hour. So when are they going to be united again? Revelation 17. When this, when God permits the four winds to be let loose, the nations become angry and they are going to once again unite again. For what purpose? To darken the sun, to obscure the righteousness of Christ, to do what? To make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Are we together? This is when we're going to see a uniting once more. All the nations are going to be involved, brothers and sisters. It's not just, again, people are, oh, it's going to happen in Turkey. No, no, no. Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, Australia, Hawaii, uh, Trinidad, St. Lucia, all the nations are going to be brought to war against the people of God. So as we look at these trumpets we see that these trumpets have come, are coming, as it were. We've passed the first six trumpets, but there's one woe trumpet left, and that is the seventh trumpet. 
So we're past the first six. When do we get to the seventh trumpet? Guess what? Seventh trumpet is open. So now God, through the, the seventh trumpet, is a woe trumpet. Say, so, well, wait a minute. It's a woe trumpet. But I thought it was against the papacy. Isn't her deadly wound to be healed? Revelation 13, she received a deadly wound, right? When did she receive that wound? 1798. Is the deadly wound to be healed? So when that wound, when that wound becomes healed, because remember when it comes healed, she is able to do what she did before. Not just influence the nations, but once again, she can persecute. Because before she was wounded, she was persecuting. Right now, she's influencing. She's like Jezebel. She's kind of, you know, encouraging people. But she needs power again. So once that wound is officially healed, guess what? God has a trumpet for it. God has that woe. One woe left reserved for the power when that deadly wound is healed. He had, hey, the wound, she, she, she suffered a deadly wound. The woes are gone. God says, no, Satan's going to bring her back. God says, guess what? I got one woe left. I got one woe left for her. And God is going to pour that woe upon her. Revelation 15, Revelation 16. Bible says in Revelation 17, the Bible says that, they, matter of fact, go there. Revelation 17. Go to Revelation 17. Notice what it says in Revelation 17, verse 1. Revelation 17, verse 1. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. I now see why God starts the vision for John like this. Look what it says. Revelation 17, verse 1. You have it? And there came one of seven angels which had the seven what? Vials. Now, what are these vials? They're the plagues. Revelation 15, 1. Revelation 16, 1. The vials filled up the wrath of God. And one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, came and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the what? Judgment of the great that set upon many waters. Now, who is talking to John here? The angel with what? with the seven vows. And he says, I will show unto thee the what? Judgment of the great whore. So John is going to see in Revelation 17 how God is going to bring the great whore to her close. Now who's talking with John? Angel that has the what? All right, so, John, so, God, so now you can imagine John looking and John says, is that the great whore that killed all those people? Man, I don't want to go in there and see her. But the angel that has one of the vows says, John, come with me. I'm going to bring judgments against her. You have nothing to fear while you're with me. Because I have the vow of wrath, the wrath of God in my hand. So John is now looking at this beast. But though she looks ferocious, John is standing with the angel that has the vow in his hand. Are you with me? So John has nothing to fear because her judgment is in this angel's hand. So no matter what she does and no matter how she growls and, and, and throws her hand at John, John has nothing to fear. John is, the angel is like, John, don't forget this. You can go over there. She ain't going to touch you. I have this in my hand. And then all of a sudden, as you go through 17, John, the Bible says that John wondered with great admiration. And he's like, John, why are you wondering after this? Why, why are you admiring this woman? You forgot these vows? This is what she's going to drink. What is God telling the church? Why are you wondering? Why are you admiring this woman for? Why are you so focused on her art? Why are you so concerned about getting a degree from her schools? Why are you so concerned about uh, 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 what she thinks about you? 
you haven't seen this? And so all those who see this vial, they're not going to wonder. This is why God is calling us to be peculiar. And so now we have, again, here's that word, context for the position that we ought to be standing in. You think you're better than people. You have context for why you, are, why you do what you do. Because you see the vial in the hand of the angel, which comes during the seventh trumpet. The sixth trumpet ended August 11, 1840. That's when the sixth trumpet came to an end because it was a blow for how long? 391 years and 15 days. So on August 11, 1840, the sixth trumpet did what? He stopped, stopped blowing. He stopped blowing. And now, John's attention goes from the blowing of the sixth trumpet to Revelation chapter 10. And now John sees a mighty angel coming down, standing with one foot on the water and one foot on the land. Having in his hand, what? A book. That's open. And what does he tell John to do with the book? Eat the book. And what does God say? God says, as you see these events taking place, he said, it's time to eat the book. It's time to eat the book. It's going to be sweet in your mouth, but it's going to be bitter. When you and I recognize this is why there is a point that you and I must go through in order to get to the open book. You have to understand the churches, the seals, and the trumpets so that you can see the need for the little book. If you bypass and you, and you, and you hold these things to be insignificant, then guess what? You're not gonna get to, you, you won't get to the little book. That's open. He didn't give him the book before he showed him the churches, did he? He didn't give him the book before he showed him the seals, did he? He didn't give him the book before he showed him the trumpets, did he? He gave it to him after he saw it. After John, now remember, the, the point is, when these things come to pass, in other words, when you see the fulfilling of these events, it's time for now. Now you have enough wisdom to open the book, to read the book. Do you get it? Why is the book closed to so many people? Because they have not received enough wisdom to take the book. That's why we don't hear the little book opened in the minister's hands anymore. This is why we don't hear it anymore. This is why it's, 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 people, don't, people don't want to bother with the little book anymore. And that's why the churches are in darkness. Because they have not been given the wisdom to open the book. And to them, it's a sealed book. That means the churches have no guiding light for their feet in these last days. I showed you a quotation, I believe it was uh, maybe a month or so ago, where the prophet says, she fears that all prophesying among us will have come to an end. That doesn't mean that, we're, we're, that we have to start making these wild predictions. But the prophesying we're talking about is being able to understand the prophecy so that you and I can know where we are. And, I, and, and again, I asked the question, if, if, if we were to ask people, when was the last time you heard a study and someone opened the little book for you, when was the last time you heard one, if you had to check it off in a box, not on the internet, but when, when was the last time you heard it in your local congregation, many will have to say, in the last five years, I have not heard any mention of it. Why is that? It is because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. 
It is because that Satan, when you read the snares of Satan and testimonies of ministers, it is one thing that Satan uh, uh, hates above everything else, and that is that we would read the testimonies and be able to see his delusions. He says, I must hide these things from them. And in one of his last deceptions, we are told, is to weaken the influence of the testimonies among us. Have they been weakened? Yes. We don't see, matter of fact, I'll close with this, on, with this passage. Go to Psalms. Go to Psalm 74. Psalm 74. Psalm 74. We close here. Psalm 74. All right, I'm going to start at verse 1. Psalm 74, verse 1. We have it. David says, O God, why hast thou what? Cast us off forever. Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Remember who? Thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old. The rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed. This Mount Zion, which thou hast dwelt, wherein thou hast dwelt. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations. Even all that the enemy have done wickedly wear. Thine enemies roar in the midst of. So God's enemies have got inside the congregation. Mercy. They do what? They set up what? All right, are you there, brothers and sisters? Verse 4. They do what? They set up their ensigns as? The enemies of the truth have gotten into the church, and they set up their signs for signs inside the church. This is what we see today. Look, look, going on. He says, a man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. But now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. Verse 9, we see not our what? There is no more what? Neither is there any among us that what? What does that mean? They don't understand the prophecies. They don't know the signs of the time. They don't know the events that are to transpire upon the earth. They don't know. And it becomes guesswork now. Everything that happens inside is, this is it. This is the big one. This is the big one. This is the big one. And every time they do that, guess what happens to the people? It destroys their faith more and more and more because it starts getting to the point where guess what? They say, oh, it's just something else. Oh, here we go again. And they can't get excited. 9-11, oh man, this is it. Nothing happened. George Bush is going to pass uh, uh, martial law. He's not leaving the White House. He's going to pass martial law, and then he's going to pass the National Sunday Law. Nothing happened. And guess what? Every time somebody says something and it don't come to pass, they just pivot. I said that. I ain't say that. And they just keep pivoting and going on to something else. Ever since Bush Sr., when George Bush Sr. stood before the United States uh, House and Senate and the State of the Union said it's time for a new world order. He, he said it's time for a new world order. It's September 11th, 1991. Everyone says he's going to pass the National Sunday Law. He then lost to Bill Clinton. Clint comes into the White House, New World Order. He already announced that it was coming. Then Bill Clinton came. Then all of a sudden, it was between Gore and Bush. 
Vatican uh, ambassador came on television and says, we are behind Bush. I was in Orlando, we were sitting in the gym and it came on television, he says, we are behind Bush and we believe Gore should stop contesting. Next day, Gore pulls out. Everyone says, this is it. Bush comes into the White House, he goes and he says, uh, uh, he dedicates John Paul Museum in Washington, D.C., and he says, we have our very own Vatican right here in Washington, D.C. And George Bush cuts the ribbon. We said, man, this is the man. He's it. There was even a political cartoon of George Bush holding in his hand a Sunday law bill. He says, my religious constituents would love this. Oh, man, he's going to do it. He's going to pass the Sunday law before he leaves the White House. And right when he was about to leave the White House, the economy was coming down. So they said, Gore, they said Bush is going to cancel the election. This, brothers and sisters, this is what I was told. He was going to cancel the election, enact martial law, and he was going to pass a national Sunday law. I said, where did you get this from? Oh, I'll give it to you. Never got it. He leaves the White House. Obama comes in. He's definitely going to do it. Nimrod was black. <laughs> He's the president. He's going to pass the Sunday law. Now, while this was going on, Pope Benedict, now brothers and sisters, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not trying to be light about it. I'm just trying to show you a timeline of false prophecies that people continue to fall for who say they believe the truth. While this was happening, John Paul had died. Well, John Paul died when, who was president? I think Clinton was president when John Paul died. Am I correct? I believe so. He died when John Paul was president. Um, and then Pope Benedict is, is elected. They called him the benediction. He was the eighth pope. They say Revelation 18, Revelation 17, he's the eighth head. Now, how do you get eight popes from over 2,000 years? I have no idea, but they said he was the eighth head. I mean, there have been, I don't know how many popes there have been, but somehow or another, Pope Benedict ended up being the eighth. So now he was to be the eighth head. He was to be the Benedict, uh, benediction. Him and Clinton were supposed to come together and pass a national Sunday law. He didn't last. He steps down. Pope Francis comes in. He's, he's supposed to pass a national Sunday law. This is the, this is the, this, this has never happened. We have never had a Jesuit Pope before in over X amount of years. Jesuit, not He's a pope. He's a pope. So what happens is, all of a sudden, Francis is supposed to do it. So Francis becomes president during Obama, right? He becomes president during Obama's time. Am I right? Yes. He becomes pope during Obama's time. They're supposed to come together. And then uh, um, uh, um, Francis and Bernie Sanders were supposed to come together, and Bernie Sanders was supposed to become president because he was, he, he was in more in line of all the people running with the Pope than anybody else. He was supposed to be the president. Didn't happen. Uh, Trump becomes the president. So now Trump becomes the president, and then the Shenanigans starts all over again. And then that doesn't go down. And then all of a sudden, um, who's running? No, no, no. It wasn't, it wasn't just recently. No, it was Sanders, right. Sanders was supposed to become the next president. Everyone was looking at Barry, uh, Barry. Bernie Sanders to become the next president. He didn't become the next president. Um, Biden becomes the next president. So now Biden's in, and now he's supposed to do it. 
Now listen, brothers and sisters. Are we getting closer to the issue? Yes. That's what we need to understand. We don't have to try to predict everybody as being a person. Brothers and sisters, all of us, all of them together is working toward that end. And in spite of their working, God is overruling for his own purposes. So, the, so our focus is not who becomes the next president per se. Our focus is, is that we are continually building. Why? Because the winds are about to blow. And God is only holding the winds. Why? Because his people are not sealed. And when I'm talking about his people, brothers and sisters, he is not talking about his denomination. That's not what he's talking about. We preach the sealing as though God is waiting for this denomination. The Bible says, sealing the servants of my God. He's not talking about a denomination. He's talking about his people who are accepting his truth. Right. Are we together? Right. And those who accept his truth will become his last day denominated people, though they will not be recognized on this earth by anybody. Right. Their names will be in heaven. Right. Are we together? Right. That's what God is waiting on. He's not waiting on the denomination to get their act together. And see, the problem is why people are confused is that we think we're preaching truth, but we're actually preaching our denomination. That's what we're preaching on people when you have the majority of the denomination who don't even care. They have, they have, their faces are towards the sun and they're worshiping the sun. They're indifferent, brothers and sisters, to the reality of the times in which we're living, they can care less about what's happening on this earth. They can care less. They're concerned about their jobs and their academics. They're concerned about their retirements. They can care less about their spirituality. We should not ignore them and give them up as, as, as and, and just turn out a blind eye to them. But the reality of it is we have, we cannot preach denomination we have to preach truth what came first the chicken or the egg so what came first the denomination or the truth we were given we were given the truth the denomination was built upon the truth if the denomination goes against the truth we don't go with the denomination we go with the truth right. are we together right. so we accept truth not by the church we accept the church because of the truth. Are you with me? That's why we accept the church. We accept the church because of truth. We don't accept truth because of the church. That's not a play on words. If the church says go left and God says go right, if we accept the truth by the church, we go left even though God said go right. Because the church voted to go left. So we got to go left with the church and leave the truth behind and hopes the truth catch up with us. But if we accept the church because of the truth, when the church goes left, guess what? And God goes right, we go right. If you look at the vision and early writings of the firm platform, she said there were some who got off the platform and began to find fault with it. She says, but there were those who stood on the platform and, 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 and basically rebuked them and some of them got back on. So what is that telling us? When others get off the platform, guess what? We don't get off to form, of, uh, form some type of unity or a bond of iniquity. We have to stand on the truth. Are you with me? That's what we have to do. Stand on the truth. And those who got off, we tell them, no, you get back on. If you want to be united, you need to come over here with us. No, you get back on here. There's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. You have to come back here. I can't come to you. You got to come here. And so the sixth angel is over. Seventh angel is now sounding. And by God's grace, this coming Wednesday, we're going to go into Revelation chapter 10, which is a prelude into the seventh angel. Into the seventh angel. Let us pray. Father in heaven. 
Lord, we pray that we really would understand where we are and what manner of person ought we to be. Help us. Help us, dear Lord, to know where we are and what we ought to do. Give us strength to be firm. Give us strength to show forth you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.